Hi, my name is Richard Derwald. I'm the coordinator of the Erie County uh, Senior Fitness Program that we call Club 99. I've been doing this now for about 22 years for Erie County Senior Services. Today we're going to really offer you, I guess, two presentations. The first being one that's been very, very popular, very, very well received, called Minimizing the Effects of Aging. The second one is going to be something that I guess I've never done before, and this is a request from Katie Earle, who runs the University Express. She says, Richard, you've had so many years' experience and you've done so many things. Why don't you tell me perhaps the people that are interested in this and University Express to give them a little idea uh, how this has affected your life. Uh, she used the words, build your character. I'm not too sure it's ever been built, but at, at any rate, uh, we're going to start now. The first, of course, is minimizing the effects of aging, and the second being my 85 years of experience. Everybody wants to live longer, but nobody wants to grow old. I think that's a fairly true statement. What does the word old mean? What does the, old, the word old mean to you? Is it a, a calendar age or is it something else? What does the word old mean? There's a new definition of old. It's a loss of mental and physical function. The fact is that the term old is no longer completely based on your chronological age. It's also based on the way you actually function. There are some who are old at age 60, while others in their 80s and even their 90s are older. But they are not old. Why? This year of 2020, we should all, some people say, oh, the good old days were wonderful and all this type of thing. We should be so glad, even at our age, that we're living today in 2020. I want to give you a little example. For example, Meals on Wheels, a great organization that we're all aware of. We're all aware of Meals on Wheels. In 1970, the average age of people receiving, receiving home delivered meals was between 65 and 75. By 2010, the average age of the volunteers delivering the meals was between 65 and 75. What's happened? 1970, 1970 to today, to well, even 2010, that may even be better today. In 2000, uh, 1970, the people receiving the meals, 65 to 75. Today, the people delivering the meals, 65 to 75. Think about how far we've come. Think about how aging has evolved. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Let's talk about, I want to go back to 1935 because it's my source of reference. In the past 85 years, we have increased our expected lifespan, I said approximately, I now say at least 20 years. From the New York Times, life expectancy hits a record high. The life expectancy gender gap has actually narrowed the gap between men, women, and longevity. Why? Let's look at the year 1935 again. I was born on February 15th, 1935. And this is a picture of myself and my mother. Why she put me in a dress, I don't know, but that's beside the point. Uh, we're gonna move right ahead with that. On February 15th, there was no government social security program. Imagine that, 1934, 1930, 1925, when you were through working, and in that, in that time, people just didn't live as long. There were no checks in the mail. There was nothing from the government. There was no direct deposit into your bank account. Absolutely not. There was no Medicare. There was no Medicare. There was no government health insurance for older people. Can you imagine? There's no Social Security. There's no Medicare. And also, 1935 was the midpoint 
of the Great Depression. I had the good fortune to be born right at that time. <laughs> May 14th, 1935, Franklin Roosevelt, Franklin Roosevelt implemented the Social Security Act, I believe it was May 14th, providing ongoing monthly financial support for all those over the age of 65. She was just one problem. Life expectancy in 1935 was only 63 and a half years. So setting the retirements at age 65 meant the majority of people, <laughs> the majority of people would die before they became eligible to collect. Back in those days when I was a little boy and growing up, they called Social Security old age pension. Lyndon Johnson, July 30th, 1965, he signed the Medicare bill. Medicare, health care. That's 1965. That's not that long ago. Well, it's not that long ago for me. Sitting next to him, a next president, Harry Truman. Truman actually received the first Medicare card. I think that's an interesting fact. So, 1935, oh, I forgot to change the date on top of that. The top three reasons we are living longer, government programs, medical and pharmaceutical technology, and sanitation. Sanitation is a thing we don't even think about anymore. Yet, when I speak out at the suburbs, uh, the suburbs of Buffalo, if you go out to Darien Center, places like that, even the other side of Alden, they were still drinking well water until maybe five or 10 years ago. Quite often that water wasn't even tested. A lot of people didn't even have running water. So their bathroom facilities were not what they are today. Let's put it that way. This is my father's visa. My dad came from Germany in 1930. Um, what you see here is the visa. He, my father was very good. He kept everything. And I, I have a, lo a lot of his papers. And um, in Germany, they had trade schools. In other words, here we have grammar school and high school and college. Well, once you get out of high school in Germany, very, very often you went to a trade school and you learned to trade. And I just read an article in the Buffalo News about a week ago that you're starting to think maybe, maybe more people should be going to trade schools and learning how to be electricians and plumbers and things along that line because there are so many people who are getting degrees really that don't give them the future that they really need. I'm sorry about this going back and forth. So the keys I'm pressing uh, are exactly the opposite of what I thought they'd be. My dad got a job at Colonial Radio. That was in the 1930s. Because they were, as their name implies, they were making radios. And uh, he was very good at figuring out maybe perhaps new designs and new things for those. This is where we lived. That's not the way the house looked when we lived there. It's one of those zombie homes now. It didn't look much better than that. But anyway, we were, li we were living there in the 1930s, uh, the 1940s, and the first part of the 1950s. Uh, 37 Florida Street, which is, you know, is in the Cold Spring area on the east side. December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. In 1942, in January, right after the New Year, they came to my father and said, you know, Carl, you can't work here anymore because you're a, a, a German citizen. You came, you came over. We're going to get government contracts and things. And one of the stipulations in those contracts is we can't have anybody uh, from Germany or the Axis nations. Well, it wasn't only true for Colonial Radio. It was true all over. So my dad got a job as a waiter at the Buffalo Athletic Club, a job that he held for more than 50 years. And uh, I actually worked there myself when I was 16, 17 as a uh, bus boy. The ironic part about it is I can look out my window here from the 13th floor of the Rath Building and see the door that I used to walk into every day uh, when I was a teenager. Just one last thing about my father because I have I loved him very dearly and never complained. And he always said this was the best country in the world, in spite of the fact that he really couldn't practice what he was trained to do. 
He worked breakfast, lunch, and supper. However, there was a big gap between lunch and dinner, so he would take a bus. Oh, by the way, we did not have a car. We never had a car until I bought one. He took a bus from the Buffalo Athletic Club back to our home on Florida Street, went to bed for an hour, got up and took the bus back downtown. He did that for almost 50 years, uncomplainingly. Also, he worked every holiday, Thanksgiving, Christmas, all the days that families get together. There were also days that those people, a lot of people wanted to go out to dinner. And my dad was a waiter. So it wasn't really easy, not really easy for my mom either because we went to other people's houses and celebrated with them. But my dad was never home. This is something that I believe, and I believe it from the bottom of my heart. Whatever your mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. And I really believe that. They call it the secret. They call it visualization. I don't care what they call it. We have got to believe in our minds. We've got to believe that we can do something. I've come to maybe perhaps realize that some people aren't capable of this. But the average person really can visualize and really materialize the things that you want in life to a certain extent, obviously. Here's me and my friend Bob in 1948. If you could ever pick out two guys that could never, ever, you'd never pick for a team. I will admit, though, that Bob did play basketball a little bit, only because he was six foot four. I don't think he was a great athlete, and I was a terrible athlete. I don't believe I had one athletic gene in my body. Here we are in 1954. Believe and achieve. We started on a program that involved our diet, exercise, mentally thinking about it. We grew, we got bigger. I got much, much, much stronger. And uh, we actually wrestled as a tag team for a while. We wrestled all around this part of the country. Uh, Bob took off to, uh, to uh, Canada, became a wrestler up there. I stayed here. We're, we're gonna move on, I'm sorry. I'm gonna ask everybody out there a question. And if your answer is no, that means that you're only 30 years old. Have you noticed that since age 21, your body has changed? Has anybody noticed that? I'll ask you again. Have you noticed that since age 21, your body's changed? Why? What causes that decline? The structure and firmness of our body, the way we move, the way we can navigate, the way we animate ourselves, it's all, it all depends on our musculoskeletal system. It determines the shape and the function of your body. Everybody out there, if you're over 50, if you're over 60, say, boy, I just hope that I'm able to, when I get to my older age, that I'm going to be able to get around, go shopping, go banking, go out to dinner, do all those things. They're afraid that they might lose it. And that fear is not completely unfounded. Mobility is provided by the musculoskeletal system. We're going to talk now about minimizing the effects of aging which is the original presentation. A question, I'll give you a second to answer it. What two conditions are most responsible for age-related visual, visual physical changes? Easy for me to say. Osteoporosis and sacropenia. Well, I, everybody heard about osteoporosis. We've all seen the ads. We've seen Sally Field talk about it on television because there's products, there was things that could make it better. There it is, responsible for physical change, osteoporosis. You can read that yourself because the monitor is too far away for me to read it. But, but I will, I will tell you this. Uh, our bones are, are living tissue. With age, they tend to get thinner. They become more porous. Things start to happen. Uh, and we lose the density of our bones. It changes everything. Question. I just talked about Sally Field. I talked about she promoted a product called Boniva, which I guess really worked well for a lot of people. I'm really sorry about this. Julie, I bet you you could do it better than me.
Then there's sacropenia. What is sacropenia? Men and women, after a certain age, lose our muscle density. There's two little graphics here. The first one showing probably the, the way your arm looked when you were 30, 25, 30, even 35. The muscle in the arm begins to shrink and it's replaced with fat. So therefore, our arms start to look flabby, our chest starts to look flabby, our midsection, my God, that's, you could really, you can, it's all because of our age. It's all part of the aging process. There we are. You can see the muscle in the arm. It's getting smaller and smaller. But everything isn't because there's the fat that's replacing that muscle, which changes the way our body looks completely. This poor guy obviously is a true victim of sacropenia. He has no muscle at all and <laughs> no fat. Are there any drugs to prevent or lessen the effects of sacropenia? We talked about osteoporosis. We talked about sacropenia. Osteoporosis, number one. Back to, I, I don't mean to pick on any actress. Back to the commercials. Uh, Boniva, all those things, they were terrible side effects. It wasn't the fault of the companies either because they tested them. The side effects happen after about three and a half, four, four and a half years. What happens is the bones become, lack of a better term, overly hardened. And they were finding out that people were getting breaks in their femur. And those breaks were all sideways. They were getting these diagonal breaks in their femur, femurs. And they found out, almost without exception, 99.99% .99 of those people were taking some kind of uh, osteoporosis medicine to prevent osteoporosis. The tragedy here is the very medicines they were taking to prevent it were causing fractures. The very thing they wanted to stop was happening. The same thing was true with sacropenia. They also had another drug that you've never heard of. And the reason you don't hear about sacropenia today is because there's nothing to sell you that will stop it. There's nothing to sell you that can stop it. They found one thing, and that one thing was anabolic steroids. They were tested too, and the results were good. Some seniors said, my God, I feel 25, 30 years younger. I feel stronger, I sleep better. But as time went on, the test group started experiencing some very bad things. Heart attack, stroke, cancer. All a direct result of the steroid antibiotic steroids that they were taking. You can see there, it's kind of scary. You can see the person, as they age, how they tend to bend over. Some of the older people tend to bend over. Their posture is terrible. Not their posture. It's that they've, they've lost so much. They've lost so much of the support of the ligaments, the tendons, the muscle tissue. And that's the problem. And here's the really big problem. Osteoporosis and sacropenia. If you're older, you're getting out of your car, you're putting something in perhaps in the trunk of the car, you don't want to fall. You don't want to let anything bang on your arm or anything along that line because you're going to fracture. To fracture is probably 100 times more probable and possible than it was when you were 25 or 30. Fact of life. What I've learned, hopefully, is that the primary treatment for osteoporosis, the primary treatment for sacropenia is exercise, resistance exercise. Pulling the latex resistance bands, lifting weights, that's, and that's proven. It will actually proven that it will increase your bone density. And if you're a younger person, you start at 40 or 45, you really probably won't even suffer from osteoporosis or sacropenia, but you gotta start. Here we go, Katie. There's a German proverb, and I'm not gonna, my dad wanted to teach me German when I was little, but for some reason, I don't know why, it wasn't very popular in the 1940s, and that is the, that is the, the expression. This is how it translates. <laughs> self okay, I am, Katie did ask me, tell people a little bit about what you've done and over the years and 
why you are who you are, <laughs> and how to get you to this point. I'm going to remember, we're going to go back to this. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, it can achieve. And that skinny kid there, raising his arm up, of course, was me. I always wanted that. I always wanted that. And one day, myself and Bob went to the wrestling matches. I think I might have been in seventh or eighth grade. And we watched that, and I said, that's what we changed. And I said, I want to be in there. Well, that's ridiculous. How can a kid that couldn't make a basketball team, a baseball team, a foot, how could he possibly become a professional wrestler? These guys were big, they were muscular, they were fast, and they were strong, and both of us decided, no, we're, we're gonna do that. We got some books by a gentleman by the name of Bernard McFadden, and we, we started following his courses. By the way, Bernard McFadden, if, I hope I'm talking to an older audience here, he's the one that, uh, started Charles Atlas. And the Atlas courses that were sold were really invented by Bernard McFadden. So, years later, I became a professional wrestler. Wrestled all over. They started me in some of the small towns. I went like Watertown and Oneonta, places like that. Then I guess finally I got my big break. I wrestled some uh, Guy from Milan, Italy, Baron Gattoni. I was probably about 205 pounds and the Baron was about 260 pounds. What I didn't realize at the time, I was just 19 and I, I didn't realize that they were bringing in another major star of, of that period and Baron Gattoni was going to wrestle him the next week. In order to make Baron Gattoni look really, really good, they told him, to work the kid over, and they did. I think I hold the world's record to being thrown out of the ring. And you have to remember, if you watch wrestling today, uh, number one is there's mats all around the outside of the ring. The rings we wrestled in the 1950s were converted boxing rings. They had no padding because the boxers, it would slow them down. So all there was was thick plywood with a little covering of canvas over it. So every time you hit the deck, you really hit it. That's why a lot of the very gymnastic moves you see today uh, could not be done back in those days. Here's some little clips I got from the Buffalo paper just to show you I'm not kidding you. Uh, I wrestled the mighty at life. You have to do that, Katie, right? You, anybody can say anything, you know? <laughs> and I think I've seen a lot of things where they are. <laughs> okay, I wrestled on Channel 2. Uh, I wrestled in Toronto. I wrestled Buffalo Memorial Auditorium, Rochester Auditorium, Syracuse Auditorium, uh, everywhere, in, probably in the Northeast at one time or another. I probably stepped through the ropes in total, maybe 150, 160 times. That probably accounts for some of them, you know. <laughs> Canal side, July 17th, I was inducted into the Ilio DiPaolo Wrestling Hall of Fame. You all know Linda Pellegrino from Channel 7 and behind him is Dennis DiPaolo, behind her is Dennis DiPaolo. That was at Riverworks, it was a wrestling show. And um, I was really quite honored uh, to be part of that, to be inducted, inducted into that Hall of Fame. While I was training for wrestling, I started reading bodybuilding and learning about bodybuilding. So I also entered bodybuilding contests. Obviously that wasn't taken yesterday, but you've got to believe in, in yourself. I think it's very important that we believe in ourselves. So many people don't. And, and you've got to do things to make what you imagine to be, make them happen. We've got to do the things necessary to get to where we want to go. Uh, this is Mr. Buffalo, 1989. Uh, the good looking guy with the big chest is me. And I don't know who those other guys are. <laughs> but at, at, at any rate, uh, that's me in uh, the master class, over 40, Mr. Buffalo. All because in seventh or eighth grade, I went to a wrestling match. And it just, it was visualization. It was imagining who I wanted to be. Everybody out there can do the same thing. Oh, I wish I would have done that when I was younger. No, you can do it right now, today. By the way, it got into my, uh, there's my son, Richie. He became, he was a, uh, Mr. Teenage Niagara, my daughter Kathy, 
That sure went through then boyfriend, Steve Downs, who went on to win the Natural Mr. Universe contest. She, Kathy was a very, she was a good athlete. She was very, very bright. She was very, very pretty. And uh, I love her very, very much. I was inducted into the Bodybuilding Hall of Fame and the Greater Buffalo, uh, I got an award for lifetime achievement in the field of bodybuilding, which I was, again, quite honored to receive. Let's get back to aging. Let's get to talk about a few things. How many times have you heard the, they brought a person into the hospital, they were suffering from dehydration? Water is free. As we age, we can lose our thirst. I have to remind myself to drink water because we actually can lose our thirst. So I want to tell everybody out there, drink at least four eight ounce glasses of water every day. Well, wait a minute. I heard eight. The doctors say eight. You can drink eight if you don't want to leave the house because if I'm going to drive anywhere, I'll be doggone, I, I cannot drink eight ounces eight, eight ounce glasses of water every day because that would not be convenient for me and it probably wouldn't be convenient for you, male or female. And I, it sounds like a joke, but the days you are home, the days you don't have to travel, sure, of course. But I would suggest too, don't drink a lot of water, say after seven o'clock at night, because it's gonna get you up. And uh, on the other hand, you gotta drink water. Otherwise, it, you're not gonna be healthy and bad things can happen if we're not enough hydrated enough. Another question. How many times have you heard they found him in his apartment, he passed out, he was suffering from malnutrition? Boy, maybe the guy didn't have any food. As we age, our digestive process changes. We're not as efficient anymore as we once were. We're not getting the vitamins, the minerals, the proteins, all those things out of our food. It's all part of the aging process. Protein. Remember when I was young, I went to the doctor, and he mentioned, and I got a little uptick in my blood, in my blood pressure. He said, oh, gee, young, you got your blood pressure going off. Of course, I was lifting weights, I'll take a lot of protein. Oh, no, he says, don't take protein. Says, you're gonna destroy your kidneys. That's all out the window now. At one time, they thought you shouldn't. When you go into Tops or Wegmans or any store, you're gonna see right at the door, and right in your face is gonna be protein, because they found out how valuable it is, especially for older people. I'm not saying take as much protein as you were when you were younger. I'm saying take twice the amount. And the best way to get it is in protein powders, which are flavored. It's like drinking a chocolate milkshake. Diet and digestion. Fiber, we all know about fiber, how, how important it is. Uh, one time, actually, uh, when I was younger again and we were trying to follow all the things that we had read, now I gotta remember, I am going back to the very, very early 50s now. My doctor, who I think was a darn good doctor, really, uh, but he told me, you know, you can't eat a lot of fiber, son, because you're gonna get colitis. They really believed that fiber caused inflammation. And if anybody had a bad stomach, they would give them things like soup and pudding, uh, which of course exasperated the, the, the process completely. Probiotics, I take them, they're good. Um, I think they do a lot of good. However, I also supplement that with yogurt, and I think that's a, a good idea. Because the health of our gut is really very, very important. Exercise, move your body, get the circulation going, and especially your legs. Your legs have the largest muscles of the body, so you wanna work on those legs. We do that in Club 99. Here's a picture of myself when we're doing leg presses using the uh, rubber or the latex exercise bands. You read this everywhere, the newspaper, the magazines, television, lots of good fruits and vegetables. That's really, really good. However, if you're older, I would strongly recommend something to everyone, and that is digestive enzymes. They're cheap, They're, they cannot hurt you, and it does help you absorb a lot more of your food. 
I've just written an article for After 50 magazine, and I talked about, well, you always say, if you eat a well-balanced meal, you don't need it to take anything. No, that's, I'm sorry. That's not true. Uh, you do, especially as you get older. Digestive enzymes are an excellent thing to, so you can get all that nourishment that you need. The vitamins, the minerals, the proteins, everything you need. Digestive enzymes will help you with that. I, obviously, I can't recommend anything here. I put a few quotes in today uh, because of what Katie Earl asked me to do. These are some of the ones that I, that I like quite a bit. Live life fully while you're here. Live life fully while you're here. Experience everything. Or as much as within our grasp. Life experience is priceless. What I've done here is list a lot of the things I've done and the jobs that I've had. And I like to, probably it's nothing to brag about, actually. But I never spent a day in a college classroom. And I spent years working for two Fortune 500 companies in management positions. I started off, though, being a laborer at American Brass over on uh, Military Road. My job did not require a lot of brain power. Uh, sometimes the, the brass tubes that they make didn't pass inspection. And me and another guy who was there for years, they had a big post, and we'd put the pipe in there, and we'd straighten it by hand. And I did that for eight hours a day. I got pretty strong, but I also got pretty damn tired. Uh, American Standard, I started in 1955. I started on the paint line. There was no OSHA then. There was nothing to protect. I wore a mask like a, remember my first or second day on the job, I had an opportunity, because I had a guy that I worked directly with. For some reason, we just didn't talk much the first day. So we're spraying the paint, and I say, <clears throat> and I said, boy, doesn't this, all this paint uh, bother your throat? He goes, never bothered me. So I said, whoa. <laughs> so there was, there, there, yeah, I, was, I think I'm going to maybe move away from this. So uh, my mother, God bless her. Uh, my mother was from Ireland, by the way, right from Ireland, a farm. She was one of 13 children. She seen I was coming home dirty and tired. She, has, she, she cut out a little ad out of the paper. And she says, Rich, look at this. It's about these computers we're talking about. She had no idea what a computer was, and I really didn't have much of an idea either. It was the Ward School of Data Processing. And uh, I called them, and I went down. I was looking for a building. It was on Delaware Avenue. There was a woman's clothing store there. And I, on the door, on the side door, was the Ward School upstairs over a woman's clothing store. I said, wow. So I went up there and I said, okay, I'll, I'll do it. I, I paid and I took the whole course. I did, I did pretty good at the course. I said, I understand this, I kind of like it. Then they posted a job up for a second shift computer operator with a chance of becoming a programmer. So I took the job and uh, that's why I became a computer operator. I was fortunate I got a chance to do things. We had good managers who utilized the people for the best that they could. Ultimately, I became head of the department there. Then, like many, many guys my age, a lot of our industries went away, and I found myself 40 years old with a heck of a good job that now required a degree, and I didn't have a degree. I said, oh boy, what am I gonna do? I had a wife who didn't work, she was a stay-at-home mom, I had, I had two kids. People told me, you're never gonna get a job like this, you know, you know you're never gonna get this again. So I, I actually said, well, I'm gonna try. So I went to a Dresser Industries. By the way, American Standard then was a Fortune 500 company. Dresser Industries was a Fortune 500 company. In fact, uh, George Bush Sr. Uh, was involved with Dresser. He's a major stock owner. And a lot of their money came from oil drilling. So I went in there and I interviewed. And I don't, I says, well, you know, there's a lot of people that are interviewing for this job. I says, well, here it is. I got all these years experience at American Standard. You're a foundry. 
they were a foundry. I know how foundries are controlled by computers. I know all about it. A couple of weeks later, they called me back. It says, we want you to, for a second interview, we're gonna send you to an industrial psychologist down in Pittsburgh. It was me and two other guys. One of the other guys was from an Ivy League university. I says, well, they're just putting me in there <laughs> because they comply with some, maybe some kind of. So they sent me down, I talked to the guy, and uh, I didn't realize at the time, he says, you know, I'm really tired, let's just go to, let's just go to lunch. And I realized after I was on the plane going home that that was my interview. Our discussion over lunch was my interview. A couple of days later, they called me and says, you got the job. I said, I got the job? She says, yeah, uh, the psychologist thinks you would work much better with the people out on the plant floor than the other, than your other two candidates. I, and I got the job. And I became the manager of the computer operation at Dresser Industries. American Standard had 1,300 employees when they closed. Dresser Industry has 1,500 employees. And we took care of the payroll, all the manufacturing things, all the work in process. It worked out very, very well. Um, Dresser closed in 19, it's the same old story. Everybody suffered. 1983, Dresser Industries closed. And I have no way of proving this because I haven't got any newspaper clippings, but they offered me a job in Europe. Uh, apparently, they thought I did okay out in, the, out in the plant in Depew, and they offered me a job in Europe that I turned down because a couple of reasons. Uh, my dad just was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Uh, my mother's had a touch of Parkinson's, and the job was for me. It wasn't for my family. They weren't. I couldn't bring my wife or kids there. So I turned the job down. This was 1983, I was gonna make $1,500 a week, but I turned it down. And instead, I opened up a day spa <laughs> in Buffalo. And uh, at one time we had 13 people working there. If you could, I just go to the library and get a phone book from 1983 and look under massage or tanning, we're there, head to toe was, was, was the name of it. And. Uh, a couple of other things I've done. I, I was a consultant for a, a kid that I hired at Dresser, and we did the we did the, the transformation over the bridge. Uh, be, Quest Diagnostics bought Smith Klein Testing, and there was some impediments to the sale because of some deficiencies and changes in the software. I'm going to stop right here and just tell you that we did it. IBM said five years. We did it in 14 months. I also authored a book that I'll tell you about in a minute. And today I'm the coordinator of Erie County Senior Services uh, Fitness Program. Here's something from the Dresser News. You can see it. Data processing, you see as many jobs. I blew it up so you can see the guy in the middle is really me. It's like, <laughs> again, I, I, just, I guess I'm paranoid about validating what I say, you know? There's my card from Silent Partner Software. We did it. 14 months. In fact, there's some good write-ups in computer world uh, that Wayne has and I, I don't have. There's our head-to-toe spa. That's me and my wife, Maureen. There's our, there is our uh, little flyer, trifold. Don't fear change, embrace it. People want to hold on to everything. You know, life, we can't hold on. Sometimes we can't even hold on to our loved ones. We can't hold on to the things that we've grown up with. We, everything changes. We change. Life changes. We have to go with those changes. People that can't, it can make them very, very ill. Change. Embrace change. If you want to live the life you've never lived, you have to do things you've never done. It's another one of my favorites. And, and I honestly and sincerely, I've lived, I believe it and I've lived it. I was an author, I authored a book. The book is on Amazon. If anybody just wants to put my name in, Richard Deerwald, you'll see I did a book for men, for men only. It's called The Secrets of a Successful Image. It sold very, very, very well. The book came out in 1995. It's still on Amazon. A book that doesn't sell well. What was that? I talked about working out, 
Uh, it talks about all the things that a man, it's actually a men's makeover book. And it did very, very well. But in some respects, I lost a year. Oh, you're an author, my God. You, you can retire on that. If I could retire on $26,000, that'd be great, because that's what I made on the book. Even though it sold, I was a first time author. I had no advance on the book. And uh, I got the royalties, which were really minuscule compared if I was an established author. I never wrote another book because I couldn't go through that again. But I think uh, it, it was good. I had occasion to travel all over. I was on the Ricky Lake show. Uh, we were up in, uh, the, in Montreal. We were on the Canadian version of 2020 and down in South Beach. Recommended book of the month by the Men's Health Book Club. You can see the book right down there for men only, focusing your image. Next to me, they're selling the book by Tony Little, if you know who Tony Little was. He, used to, he had a ponytail and he used to ride a bicycle real fast. Okay. <laughs> I think that's a jerk. Okay, here we go. Music. Rick, if you're watching this, Rick Fatowski does some great stuff on Buffalo music. I'm not gonna elaborate on that. You could probably do a whole University Express on my musical career. <laughs> but that's for the Buffalo News. And that's a picture of me singing much later, maybe five, six years ago, at uh, Nietzsche's down on Allen Street. But again, I'll repeat it, self-praise stinks. <laughs> I did some acting. And that's, I, was, I acted with a uh, biracial, uh, interracial acting group. We, we did stuff at Baird Hall. We did stuff at the Chautauqua Amphitheater. And we did things at the Mary Seton Room in Klein Hans Music Hall. We did all James Baldwin's works. and. Uh, they always dealt with, with race, and I was always the bad guy. So, but that was a very marvelous experience. I did that for about a year and a half. Here's something, it's a declaration of originality. When my son was young, you know, I was a wrestler, I was teaching him about tag team wrestling. And he had action figures of Superman and Batman. And we put, I put them on a table and I was showing them all these. And I thought to myself, they should make action figures of wrestlers. Boy, would, that would, I think would be a pretty good idea. So I sent him a long letter. Sorry, so I, you'll see the woman next door, her name was Marie Coleman. She was also a notary public. I wrote him a five page letter, that, that's the last page. And I signed it and Marie signed it and put her notary stamp on. They sent me back a letter saying, oh yeah, that, that sounds like a good idea. And that's the end of it right there. I had a sign, guess what? They were gonna give me $10,000 for writing a five-page letter. I says, wow, this is great. And I asked her about royalties. And she says, oh no, um, no royalties because this is already, whenever the, the date was there, says September, or, all our big toys are all done for the year. However, this is a filler toy and we would like you, uh, we're, we're gonna give you this chance. We don't usually do this. I says, oh, that's great, $10,000, that's nice. Here's a check for $10,000. On the phone, I asked her, would you please send me one of each of the, of the action figures so I could have them for myself? She goes, sure, no problem. When they sent them to me, there was a catalog stuck in the middle of the box. I took out the catalog, I opened it up. In the center fold was my idea. It was their lead toy of the whole year. They sold $350 million of action figures in that first year. I got, I got $10,000. They, they uh, spent about $30,000 introducing the toy at the toy fair. So I really got mad. I was lied to. Uh, that's my lawyer. We, we sued him. It came to nothing. What I didn't realize, I should have got a lawyer on contingency because I paid this guy $7,000. And what I found out several years later, his father was one of the founders of the, of the company that I was suing. 
So you see, everything doesn't go well for us. One person told me, if that was me, I quit my job and I stand out in front of their place every day with a sign and tell everybody, I said, I'm not going to do that. I should have had 3.5 million. Custom and practice is 1%. They sold 350 million. So I should have had 3.5 million. Believe it or not, even today I don't have 3.5 million. Uh, photo of me and my, and my daughter, Kathy. Uh, so she was little, she's probably about eight or nine. Pretty little girl then, smart little girl. And uh, we were born on the same day within the same time. So every year we celebrated our birthdays together, February 15th. Grief is like the ocean, it comes in waves, ebbing and flowing. Sometimes the water is calm and sometimes it is overwhelming. All we could do is learn how to swim. Um, that's Kathy's obituary. She died at 39 of a brain aneurysm. Nothing, she, she took very good care of herself. There's some things you just can't control. And uh, what you're looking at here, I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna read it, but I'll just say she was on the Regis show. Uh, she was on the Montel Williams show for, for different things. She had her own little talk show down in Florida and a uh, little a thing called Extra Extra too. She, when, they were, when Kathy Lee left Regis' show, there was gonna be 10 people picked and Kathy was one of the 10 that was gonna take Kathy Lee's place. We had Channel 7 over at her house, everybody was there. And obviously she didn't make the cut. I think the winner was predetermined. It was Kelly Ripa, I'm pretty sure. And she's very good. I, this is important. If you eat a balanced meal, you don't need supplements. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm gonna have to look down for a minute when I'm doing this. In a White House ceremony, I wanna talk about a guy named Ray Kurzweil. In a White House ceremony, Kurzweil received the 1999 Medal of, of Technology and Innovation, the United States' highest honor in technology from President Clinton. He received $500,000 from the Lemonson MIT Prize. By the way, he went through MIT in 14 months, all four years and 14 months. He's a very credible, I would say, a credible guy. In 2002, he was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame, established by the U.S. Patent Office. He has received 21 honor, honorary doctorates and honors from three U.S. presidents. The Public Broadcasting Service, PBS, included Kurzweil as one of the 16 revolutionaries who made America. Inc. Magazine called him Edison's rightful heir. That's enough. You just you have to know to talk about Ray Kurzweil could be an entire University Express talk. Brilliant, brilliant guy. Today he's chief engineer at Google. My old job. On the cover of Time magazine, there's a picture of Ray Kurzweil. Live forever. He's working now. I'm being able to give shots. We're talking about COVID shots, which we need desperately, by the way, vaccinations and things. But he's talking about injecting microscopic little robots into our system to replace our immune system. They would, find, they would seek and destroy things that were wrong, especially things like cancer. That's, that's his mission. But Ray's getting older. He's, I think he's 78. He, he doesn't even see his mission happening until 2045. Meet the Google executive who plans to cheat death. Ray Kurzweil takes 150, these are not vitamins, they're all kinds of things, that actually is wrong. 150 vitamins a day so he can hold out long enough for the invention of robots that will keep humans alive. You can't, you, you could say, oh, you know, but the fact is that Kurzweil is doing it. He's got to be some, he's not somebody pitching something on Saturday morning on the radio. This is the chief engineer at Google who has a lifetime of achievement. Let's talk about arthritis. More than a third of all adults in the United States suffer from osteoarthritis. Minimizing the effects of osteoarthritis, first thing you got to do is lose weight. And by the way, 
Obesity is one of the main reasons that people die from COVID-19. Obesity is destroying our country. For every pound you lose, it takes four pounds of pressure off your knees and six pounds off your hips. That's pretty significant. Imagine losing 25 pounds. The difference that can make. Not, not you, Katie. But the, <laughs> okay. Here's a prescription from the Arthritis Foundation. Motion is lotion. Translated, the more you move, the more you're able to move. Whatever happened to my friend Bob that you saw early, the tall guy standing next to me? Here we are uh, at age 60. There we are at 60, the two of us. He's still taller than me. Uh, we were the featured speakers at the Los Angeles Times Health and Fitness Expo. Uh, it was on the campus of UCLA. We spoke there in, in, in 2006. That's me and him on this stage. I got a story that really Bob related to me. Uh, he, got a, he got a job as activities director uh, at a very large uh, facility, ad adult living. And very big dining rooms as the people would all come in and they would save a chair for this one old guy to come in. He would come in with a walker and he looked at him for a few days. He goes, boy, why don't you, uh, he says, what's wrong? He says, oh, my doctor. He says, well, I can help you probably. Come up to the gym, we'll do leg presses, we'll do some of those things. Exercise can do a lot. The guy said, no. He says, you, you sound like a nice guy, but the doctor's already told me. I'm going to, I'll be in a wheelchair probably in a month. He says, no, no, no. He talked to some other people. They finally did, he finally did agree to come up. This, this is about minimizing the effects of aging. The miracles you can perform. He went up to the gym, he started doing leg presses, just like the picture I showed you earlier with the resistance bands. A walker or a wheelchair, he had his choice. The onset of physical decline can be significantly delayed and in some cases reversed. Here he is from the walker to a cane. Stronger is better. No more walker. He went from the cane to walking alone. He would, after dinner, after the luncheon, he would get up, he'd walk out to the lobby, down the driveway, turn right, and go to, he loved ice cream, and they wouldn't serve ice cream there because so many people suffer from sugar. This guy loved ice cream. He walked down by himself. No cane, no walker, no nothing. Got himself an ice cream and walked back. All because my friend Bob pushed him and coached him. He knew what I knew because we learned it together how important exercise is, and all the things that we can do for ourselves. It's a lesson we all should learn. Haven't spoken about my wife. We've been married for over 50 years. This was in 2016, was our 50th wedding anniversary. Here's my grandkids. You can see they're all athletes. The little girl in the middle is Jada. She's a gymnast. The little girl with the suit on and the belt is Summer, she does Taekwondo, and the little guys yet are supermen in training. And that's, <laughs> that's their old papa right there. There's my son and there's the family. They're, they're entertainers. Before they had the children, they worked for Caesars. They worked at the Fountain Blue in Miami. Uh, they've had a very good career, but the kids are more important now. But it, it has cost them an awful lot financially, but they, you, Debbie loves being a mother. I think Richie loves being a father. So that's the family. A recap. As people grow older, increased protein intake and regular resistance exercise, are, they're, they're the ticket. Minimizing the effects of aging. Clinical studies now prove your bones and muscles can rebuild themselves with the right nutrition. Protein, resistance exercise. You cannot increase bone density just by calcium. Another misnomer that everybody was following. The best thing that calcium can do is make you constipated. You've got, you've got to have all these other things. You've got to have magnesium, boron, copper, manganese, potassium, phosphorus, nickel, all these different things. You've got to have the complete spectrum of minerals because your bones 
are consist of the complete spectrum of minerals. I would suggest taking a multi-mineral tablet. The recap, the effects of aging, vitamin, mineral, and other supplements, just look up Ray Kurzweil. He's on lifeextension.com. Now I'm gonna talk about, this is, we're just about done. Club 99, you all know what it is. It's the Erie County Senior Services Fitness Program. We have one of the largest in the state. I guess this is New York State, so we have one of the largest in the nation. And uh, up, up until the virus time, we had over 1,000 people, over 1,000 people coming every single week to group exercise programs all around Erie County. The two people you see that I'm holding up their arms, that's, on, that's, that's an old picture. Ann Constantino has a 97 on her. She's now 98. El, uh, we celebrated Elmer's birthday last year. He's now 100. And he still comes to classes, and Ann still teaches the class at the North Buffalo Community Center. You get a latex band. This is the average. This is the commercial. Every resistance group exercise participant, a latex resistance band, illustrated instructions, and weekly personalized group exercise sessions. It's all free. Only two more slides. I'd like, to, if you just think about these two things. Those who think they have not time for a bodily exercise will sooner or later have to find time for illness. Last one, don't let your fear of what could happen make nothing happen. And that is it. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope I've said something meaningful that will help you in your life. Again, thank you very much. Thank you, Katie Earl, for uh, inviting me to speak for University Express. Thanks, Chuck, for being so patient with me. And I really do know how to move these slides both ways now. Okay. Thank you and goodbye.